Good morning and welcome to Micro Motions webinar titled Coriolis Performance in Entrained Gas with Advanced Phase Measurement, part of the Flow Control Training Series. Thanks so much for joining us today. First, I'd like to take care of a little housekeeping and then we will get straight to the presentation. We welcome your comments and questions. during this live event. If you have questions or any technical problems during the presentation, please type them in the question box. We will take care of any technology issues as they occur, and our presenter will answer your questions about the presentation at the end of the webinar. If we don't get to all the questions, we will post the responses on our Flowstream blog as soon as possible. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our sponsor, Micromotion, an Emerson process management brand, who produces flow and density measurement equipment. Today, Laura Schaefer, Vice President, Oil and Gas Flow Solutions for Emerson, will discuss the challenge of flow measurement when multiple phases are present. Laura has 14 years in the oil and gas industry and has worked in numerous countries throughout her career. She holds several patents as well as a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science from the Colorado School of Mines in Chemical Engineering and Petroleum Refining. Laura, we look forward to hearing more details from you, so please take it away. Thanks, Lori. I'm pleased to be here today to first review the impact of gas on Coriolis measurement, and then to introduce recent enhancements to Coriolis performance for intermittent two-phase flow, specifically in oil and gas applications. The new software package that I will in introduce, um, Advanced Phase Measurement, handles both entrained gas in liquid and mist in gas. However, in this talk, I will focus on just the entrained gas and liquid functions. Accurate measurement of liquid in spite of the presence of gas has been a tremendous challenge for the industry. Whether looking for cost reductions in wellhead measurement in the heavy oils of Canada, or looking to remove the impact of gas in liquid measurement off poorly operating separators or GLCCs, I've worked with many operators who have struggled to reconcile their allocation volumes measured at the wellhead or test separator with the totals from sales, whether that be via lacked unit or tank volume. While there are thermodynamic reasons to explain the differences in volume between pressurized allocation volume measurement versus a sales volume measurement of the same volume or of the same mass at nearly atmospheric pressure, often shrinkage alone cannot account for the volume differences observed. Consistently, the allocation measurement comes in significantly higher than the sales measurement. This can result in significant confusion as to where the supposed loss originated. Some operators just increase the shrinkage factor without lab or composition data to support it, while others spend significant amounts of time trying to track down the well or wells that may be underproducing. And some may even write it off as theft. And throughout this process, trying to balance the allocation, whether that be off the wellhead or off the separator, versus the tank, operators are exposed to potential legal action if called to defend allocation measurements used to divide up the royalty payments, all because their flow measurement technology doesn't give insight beyond volume. This lack of clarity and confidence in the metering technology undermines our ability to forecast future production or accurately assess reserves and asset value. So a quick survey question to warm us up here. What technology do you prefer for applications that expect intermittent entrained gas, such as measurement off the oil leg of a separator or measurement directly off the wellhead for heavy oils? A multi-phase meter, Coriolis meter, turbine meter, differential pressure measurement, or just install an additional separation unit. We'll go ahead and give us a few moments for folks to submit, submit answers. And it looks like 73% of the folks, at least on this call, prefer a Coriolis meter. I see that uh, a number of folks also put in an additional separation unit, um, which can be a really great uh, solution, especially if things are fairly gassy. So the reason why Coriolis is likely preferred is because of their consistent reliability and performance uh, and their multivariable nature. 
when you're looking at a, a older technology and you see a flow trace like the one on this graphic, you're left with wondering, is that a real flow or a bubble? The multivariable aspect of the Coriolis meter providing density as an additional uh, measurement allows you to identify that that is likely a bubble. That sort of insight just isn't available uh, with single variable uh, technologies like turbine meters, for example. Another alternative uh, for getting accurate measurement is a true multiphase meter, which typically includes multiple independent measurements and have historically been an order of magnitude or more costly than single phase technologies, both in the upfront cost and in the ongoing maintenance of the nuclear source. Coriolis meters with their multivariable insight and two phase confirmation can provide great insight into extremely challenging applications. That said, Coriolis, though they indicate two phases, often struggle with accuracy when two phases are present. So typically, Coriolis meters have been confined to measurement off a separator where most of the gas has been removed or in custody transfer measurements that are single phase, usually by regulatory definition. So when we look at more complex flows, flows with significantly more gas, typically those, have been, those measurements have been uh, filled by compact separators, multi-phase flow skids, or true multi-phase meters. When the value, location of the well, and regulatory environment have justified the expense. With the introduction of advanced phase measurement for the Coriolis mass meter, a Coriolis meter can be comfortably applied in more challenging flows that contain more gas than previously handled by the Coriolis meter. When I say more gas, we're going to be talking up to 15% gas void fraction. Certainly, a Coriolis meter is never going to take the role of a true multi-phase measurement, but we're, we're looking at how we can expand the, the capabilities of Coriolis that uh, we currently have. So in this talk, we will first cover how Coriolis meter measurement accuracy is impacted by entrained gas. This section will inform the best practices for use of Coriolis meters with multiple phases and perhaps explain to some why their current installations may be giving less than desired performance. In the second section, I'll cover the enhancements that the new advanced phase measurement upgrade will provide to measurement and we'll look at laboratory data that indicates what's possible. Then we'll look at a few of the algorithm's requirements and limitations, and definitely there are limitations to be covered, but we can stretch the envelope of its applications, and we'll show that in the results section, the third section. Um, we'll show a few, few field results and wrap up with installation and application considerations. So to speak to Coriolis operation with entrained gas, I'll begin with a brief brush up, very brief brush up on Coriolis operation. Um, certainly, I expect most folks on the call to be very familiar with this, so I will rush a bit through here. So in a Coriolis meter, process fluid enters the sensor and is typically split between two tubes with half the flow through each tube. The sensor flow tubes are vibrated in opposition to each other, energized by a drive coil as shown in the top set of pictures. Those tubes will oscillate at their natural frequency, which we'll cover in a moment, and that will provide the density measurement. Mounted to the flow tubes on the sides of the meter as shown in the bottom picture and circled in orange there are the magnet and coil assemblies referred to as pickoffs. Those generate voltage in the form of a sine wave as the tubes vibrate. Those tubes are vibrating and during a no flow condition as shown on the left, there is no Coriolis effect and the sine waves are in phase with each other. Keep in mind that the tubes continue to vibrate at their natural frequency even when there is no flow. I've had that question several times. When fluid is moving through the sensor's tubes as shown on the right, Coriolis forces are induced and that causes the flow tubes to twist in opposition to each other. The time difference or that phase shift between the sine waves, that's called delta T or the time delay. That delta T is directly proportional to the mass flow rate. So again, no flow on the left, the delta T is zero, thus the mass flow rate is zero. And on the right, delta T is greater than zero and mass flow is measured. For the density, that's based on the natural frequency of the system, including the flow tubes and the process fluid. 
In the animation shown here, the meter on the left contains a greater mass in its tubes, such as liquid, than the meter on the right, which has less mass, as, say, like air. So the one on the left is vibrating at a lower frequency than the meter on the right that has less mass vibrates at a higher frequency. Coriolis meters can be extremely sensitive, and the most sensitive can detect density changes to an accuracy of plus or minus 0 0.002 grams per cc. These meters are typically calibrated on both air and water prior to leaving the factory, and the extremely linear nature of the density to frequency relationship allows those two calibrations to provide accurate measurement over a broad range of liquids. Knowing both mass and density accurately, a Coriolis meter then calculates volume by dividing the mass flow reading by the density of the fluid. The resulting measurement is very accurate with single phase fluids. This is important to understand, especially with regards to entrained gas, because Coriolis meters can only measure the bulk fluid in the tubes. If a pure liquid is present, then the mass of the liquid and the density will be accurately measured, flowing that the volume is then accurately measured. However, when, or the volume is accurately calculated. However, when gas is present in the meter, the mass flow of both the gas and liquid will be measured as the bulk density of the gas plus liquid. And because gas has little mass when compared to liquid, and because a small amount of gas can significantly impact the measured density of the bulk mixture, Coriolis meters will typically overmeasure volume when gas is present. If Coriolis meters only provided mass and density measurements, operators would still struggle with entrained gas measurement. However, Coriolis meters have a diagnostic variable, drive gain, that can be used to differentiate between single phase and multiple phase measurements. This insight is key into advancing the algorithms used to make more accurate measurement when two phases are present. So looking in detail at drive gain for detection of multiple phases, Coriolis electronics monitor the amplitude of vibration of the tubes and input power required to keep them vibrating to a set amplitude. In this drawing, the tubes are vibrating to an amplitude of 0.36 millimeters initially, as shown on the uh, scale to the right. As gas is introduced to the meter at about four seconds in, the drive gain immediately increases. This is because the presence of two phases with different densities will dampen the tube vibration, requiring more power to be input to keep the tubes vibrating at that natural frequency. Once drive gain reaches 100% or saturation, no more power may be input to keep the tubes vibrating. The maximum power is already being input, and the amplitude of vibration begins to fall off. The meter will continue to measure, however, the quality of the measurement begins to degrade. Understanding that drive gain is fantastically sensitive diagnostic for indication of two phases, we can use drive gain to distinguish between composition changes within the liquid and the presence of multiple phases. In the chart on the right, we see a density change, but drive gain remains low. Since drive gain remains low, we know that there's still only a single phase present within the meter. So with confidence, we know that a composition change has occurred within the liquid. For example, here, an increase in water cut. Likewise, if that density went down, but drive gain remained low, we would interpret that as a decrease in water cut. And it's all based on the drive gain that we know that that's a composition change of the liquid. When a density change is accompanied by a spike in drive gain, we know with confidence that this isn't a decrease in water cut, but that it is a definite indicator of bubbles within the liquid phase. Conversely, the same is true for gas flows. A density increase coupled with a drive gain increase indicates the presence of liquid within gas flow. So drive gain can be a tremendously powerful diagnostic. So another survey question here, how often do you utilize drive gain today to identify and troubleshoot and train gas challenges with your Coriolis meters?
We'll give folks a minute to reply here. Not a full minute, just joking. All right, and so we've got 30% of the folks on the call always use it, 20% often use it, and we've got a full 25% who never use it. So this is, it's really excellent that some of you are already utilizing this diagnostic, but I would really encourage those of you who never do to go ahead and take a look at some of your most errant well pad measurements. Go ahead and data log from your Coriolis and check to see if your drive gain is spiking or saturated at 100%. If it is, you've got a second phase in that process and adjusting either the level that you keep in the oil bucket or adjusting how quickly your um, valves are closing or your, um, your dump is closing, that can make a tremendous difference in the quality of your measurement, your allocation measurement versus your sales measurement. Now to make more accurate measurement with multiple phases present, we not only need to understand drive gain and density, but we also need to understand the errors incurred on mass and density when large amounts of gas are present. So Coriolis meters are inherently single phase meters. The basis of their design requires that the center of mass of the fluid move with the center of mass of the vibrating tubes. On the left, you're looking at an animation down the length of a single flow tube of a Coriolis meter. As the tube vibrates about the center line, the center of mass of that tube and the center of mass of the fluid are identical. However, on the right, when a particle of a different density is present in the liquid, for example, a low-density bubble, the center of mass of the fluid and that of the tube are not aligned. The bubble moves further across the center line, skewing the center of mass. The greater the difference between these centers of mass, the greater the error. This disconnect between the centers of mass is referred to as decoupling, and this is the dominant source of error when multiple phases are present. Other sources of error do exist, but in our testing, comp uh, compression and resonance effects are minimal when compared to the effect of decoupling for typical oil field allocation meter sizes. The relationship between decoupling and the error that can be expected when entrained gas is present in the Coriolis meter can be summarized in a single plot of non-dimensional parameters. So this is a, the decoupling model shown here. And I'll walk everyone through it. So on the left axis is the decoupling ratio. Now remember decoupling referred to how the center of mass of that bubble versus the center of mass of the liquid moved. A ratio of one on the left axis indicates that the fluid and the tube centers of mass are moving in sync. The coupling ratios above and below one indicate that a particle is present that is skewing the center of mass. The further away from a decoupling ratio of one, the more the error incurred on the measurement. On the x-axis is the density ratio of fluid to particle. In the case of entrained gas, the density of the liquid is much, much greater than that of the particle, which in this case is a bubble. So for entrained gas, we typically look at density ratios between 100 and 1,000, so out there far to the right on that x-axis. At those density ratios, you see lines above a decoupling ratio of one in red, orange, gray, green, and blue. So you see those lines there. What determines which line we're on, and thus the decoupling ratio expected in your system, is the inverse Stokes number. As shown in the callout in the center of the graphic, the greater the inverse Stokes number, the less the decoupling ratio thus the less the error expected in the mass and density measurement. So maximizing the inverse Stokes number will minimize expected error. So let's maximize the inverse Stokes number. So the inverse Stokes number is defined as the square root of two times the kinematic fluid viscosity divided by the frequency of vibration of the meter times the particle radius squared. Knowing that a larger inverse Stokes number equals less error, 
Let's examine the impact of each of these variables. All right, so first in the numerator on the top, we have viscosity. The greater the viscosity, the larger the inverse Stokes number, the less the error. This makes sense if we think back to our decoupling animation. Think back, in a viscous fluid like honey, for example, the bubble will move less, decouple less, than a bubble in a low viscosity, like, uh, low viscosity fluid like water, where the bubble can move much more freely. Unfortunately, in most systems, we don't have the option to change the viscosity of our flowing fluid. Um, though we would have more accuracy if we could flow honey instead of water. <laughs> but it does inform where we might expect less error in systems with those, that greater viscosity. In the denominator, we have both frequency and particle radius. So to maximize the Stokes number, we want to minimize both of these terms since they're in the denominator. For frequency, selection of a Coriolis meter with the lowest possible frequency is key to minimizing in-train gas errors. I've seen this in many cases across our own portfolio of Coriolis meters. Our offerings with high frequency generally struggle with in-train gas, whereas our larger profile, lower frequency meters perform very well. So selecting that... Um, that lower frequency meter can make a tr big, big impact as to success in measuring with entrained gas. Finally, particle radius, that term squared, it's going to have a very large impact on the error imparted. So anything that can be done to minimize bubble size will make a dramatic impact on whether you have a lot of error or minimal error with entrained gas. This is generally the easiest term to impact via installation and meter sizing. So one of the easiest ways to minimize bubble size, especially in low viscosity fluids, is to promote turbulent flow. So keeping velocity high, you're going to get a much, much better measurement, all else equal. So look at the, top, the plot on the top right showing mass flow error versus flow rate. The lowest flow rate of 10 pounds per minute has the greatest error with increasing GVF, whereas the highest flow rate of 40 pa 45 pounds per minute has, less, uh, has only 1% error with 10% GVF. That's a huge difference in the error imparted purely by flowing faster, and it's not so much the velocity that makes the difference. It's the fact that bubbles are being broken up by turbulent flow. It's critical to understand that key role that bubble size plays in meter accuracy. When bubbles are expected, sizing a meter to maximize flow rate through the meter is, is really important. So oftentimes, though, with oil and gas applications, high flow rates through the meter are not possible for one of two reasons. One is that the fluid is a light hydrocarbon and prone to flashing. Here, downsizing the meter to keep flow rate high will impart additional pressure drop and potentially induce flashing. In this case, we encourage you to continue to oversize the meter and better keep the fluid single phase in the first place. Prefer to measure lower in the meter's accuracy range uh, with single phase rather than promote multiple phases. In the second case that... Uh, oil and gas sizing is, is uh, challenged. It's with uh, fluids with high viscosities and low system pressures. The pressure drop through the meter could be too high for that system. So I'm thinking in particular of heavy oil wells where the pressure at surface is sometimes uh, in the 10 to 20 PSI range. In this case, Sizing for high uh, velocity through the meter often imparts too high a pressure drop um, with those viscous heavy oils. So in these cases, a candid conversation needs to be had between yourself and, and whoever's doing your sizing around accuracy expectations. A significant error can be imparted if the meter is oversized or if those bubbles are allowed to be large. Anytime that it's possible, um, and your reservoir engineer allows it at least, increase back pressure on the meter. 
Increasing back pressure serves two purposes. One, it decreases the gas void fraction. And two, it decreases the bubble size, greatly increasing that inverse Stokes number and decreasing the error. For those interested in a deeper dive on that decoupling model, please check out the links in this uh, webinar environment. Included is a link to the North Sea Measurement Conference Proceedings where Joel Weinstein, Research and Development Head at Micromotion, um, he's got a white paper in there and presented on multi-phase effects on Coriolis measurement. That paper has the derivation of the decoupling model in it. So if you really want to brush up on your partial differential equations, um, go ahead and pull that paper. Additionally, um, there's a link to a short YouTube video that summarizes the decoupling and, uh, model and best practices to minimize it. So if you forget what I've, I've mentioned here, it's available there. Um, finally, install meters in a flag flow up position when entrained gas is expected. In tubes down position, which was shown on this graphic here in the bottom right, um, Bubbles will tend to accumulate on the inlet side of the meter due to their natural buoyancy and slip past the fluid resulting in fewer bubbles on the outlet side, again due to that natural buoyancy and slip. This phenomenon, especially at low flow rates, causes an imbalance between the tubes, imparting additional error beyond that described by decoupling. So always, always install the meters, flag flow up when you expect and train gas. Uh, the opposite is true if you're talking about gas flows with a little bit of liquid. You'd always, for Coriolis meters, want to install those flag with flow down. That way liquid clears out of the meter as quickly as possible. So, in summary for the best practices, the magnitude of error is driven by the value of that inverse Stokes number. So, General recommendations are to use a low-frequency Coriolis meter with the latest electronics, keep the flow rates high for effective mixing, and increase pressure to reduce the bubble size and gas volume fraction whenever possible. Install those meters, flag, flow up. Okay, so once you've followed these best practices, now we can talk about how software algorithms can make a big difference in accuracy. And that's really important to note, is if you don't have the best practices followed, it's really hard for any algorithm to make corrections of the dramatic errors that you can have when best practices aren't followed. So in this section, we'll introduce advanced phase measurement. And we'll start with the earliest of algorithms that had been developed for handling entrained gas. So recalling how the Coriolis measurement is impacted by bubbles, we know that the mass measured at the meter is roughly equivalent to the mass of the liquid, since the mass of gas relative to the mass of liquid is zero, as shown. Because mass measured is approximately the mass of the liquid, the volume of the liquid can be calcula calculated by dividing mass measured by the density of the liquid. Okay, density of the liquid's in blue there. Basic algorithms available for Coriolis will either take a user input density of the liquid, so I'd say I'm flowing water, I'd input that density into the algorithm as, say, 1, and then the volume of liquid would equal that mass measured divided by 1. So, for example, in the, the graphic up here, you'll see when a bubble is present, drive gain pops up to 100%. Mass flow rate gets noisy, but remains roughly accurate as long as the amount of gas is low. So you'll take that mass divided by some user input density. That's the simplest way. Other algorithms had been developed that use the approach to determine density based on last known good density. And that can be achieved by setting a drive gain threshold. So the user would input some drive gain threshold as shown here in orange. This one is set at, for example, 10%. Once the drive gain exceeds the user input threshold, the algorithm will look back a set number of seconds, usually three to five seconds, and take an average density at that point. Because the drive gain is low at that point, we can be confident that the algorithm is grabbing a liquid-only density, 
And that last known good, liquid-only density, is then held through the gas event, as shown in the green line here. Once drive gain drops back below that threshold, the drive gain threshold in orange, the held density is released, and the algorithm returns to reporting and using the live density. So this is how the simplest algorithms available on the market today use uh, and see through uh, intermittent bubble events. This particular technique, um, we refer to it as transient bubble remediation, or TBR. It's quite simple, and it's excellent for um, applications, say, off an oil dump of a separator where the oil density is fairly consistent. This means that between each dump, um, the algorithm has a very nice density to look back and see. If your density is changing quite a bit over time, say you've got a lot of water carry under, for example, that this can be a more challenging that could be a more challenging scenario for transient bubble remediation to accurately um, remediate. Additional, um, additionally, a problem or a challenge with using this sort of approach is that you need to set that drive gain threshold very accurately for good measurement to take place. So in this example here, if you set the drive gain threshold at 10%, you make a very good measurement right away, and you can see as density drops off, you're immediately remediating. Whereas if the drive gain threshold was left at factory default of 50% or set at 40%, you can see that the um, drive gain crosses that threshold after the measurement has already been started, been impacted by a bubble. So you can see that density beginning to come down that's impacting your volume measurement and causing a slight over measurement. So this sort of algorithm is very, very sensitive to setting thresholds accurately. So what can we do to minimize that sort of sensitivity? Well, setting a single drive gain threshold, for example, with this data set, is a really daunting task. This data set is from a Coriolis meter installed directly off a heavy oil well. Um, notice the noise in the mass and volume flow rate. Notice also the widespread in the density measurement. It ranges from 0.6 specific gravity up to 1. This indicates qualitatively that the gas void fraction could be as high as 40% at points. With the new advanced phase, phase measurement algorithm, high points in density are continuously monitored versus drive gain and other internal diagnostics to intelligently identify both how the density of the base liquid is changing and also calculate a real-time gas void fraction. Based on the gas void fraction and the dynamically determined drive gain threshold, adjustments for expected mass flow error are made based on understanding of the decoupling model presented earlier. The results from the advanced phase measurement output for mass, volume, and density show that the gas noise have been stripped out from the remediated process variables. Notice that the density now ranges from 0.965 to 0.96. So rather than being influenced by bubbles and bouncing down to 0.6 specific gravity, um, the density is now reading the liquid only. Additionally, the mass and volume reported are much more stable and easier to interpret as that gas noise has been stripped out. The original variables or we call them unremediated process variables, are still available as outputs for traceability, as well as real-time gas void fraction output to indicate the percent of gas present at any moment in time. So the key points of advanced phase measurement and what the algorithm is doing are as follows. The algorithm uses drive gain and those other internal diagnostics and meter history to identify periods of good measurement and use those to correct periods that are influenced by the two-phase flow. There's no need to input a drive gain threshold as the transmitter will determine an appropriate threshold based on diagnostics and historical data. So that's a significant improvement over previous algorithms. 
Flows can be very gassy as only a second of good data within an hour is required to identify new liquid properties. Um, so the algorithm is constantly looking at that density and the internal diagnostics and determining what the density of the liquid should be. Mass or volume can be remediated depending on the flow regime. So depending on whether you expect continuous flow or whether you expect variable flow, um, different corrections can be applied. So expected performance of the advanced phase measurement or APM algorithm is stated at plus minus 3% liquid accuracy in up to 15% gas volume fraction once best practices are followed. Okay, this patented algorithm is also available for the mist and gas applications as well. So APM consists of three feature keys that can be independently activated. So the first is PO, that's a net oil application that can either calculate water cut based on user input densities, or it can accept a water cut value from an external device. The PL key is what we're covering today. And this provides the ability to remediate liquid process values in the presence of gas, as just discussed. The PO and PL keys can be combined to get net oil calculations in the presence of gas. Finally, that PG uh, license key provides the same approach except to the gas applications of the Mr. Liquid. Note that APM does not have custody transfer approvals at this time. The real benefit and value to you would come from the insight gained from more accurate accounting of your liquid versus gas flows. The advances represented by APM are made possible by advances in transmitter technology, and we've seen significant advances, advances in those in recent years. Um, the new 5700 transmitter for Micromotion features a tremendous amount of computing power and an impressive amount of memory storage with a historian that holds one second data for up to 30 days and five minute data over the life of the transmitter. The APM algorithm quite simply wouldn't be possible on any previous transmitter just because we need such a, such a large data storage area, a large buffer to enable this algorithm to work. APM and the transmitter in general are fully, configure, uh, fully configurable from that display, providing ease of use. So even if you've got the net oil application running, you can input the oil and water densities right there at the display with no need for a computer connection, etc. cetera. Um, presence of a real-time clock with audit log can provide clarity on changes that have been made to the configuration, and security features will allow you to prevent and block unwanted changes. With that advanced phase measurement upgrade, you'll get gas void fraction output via the display and via your output channels, and both remediated and unremediated totals and rates are available as are daily contract totals based on that real-time clock. All right, so. We've set this up. Let's see how it performs. So laboratory testing indicates that APM can very effectively remediate totals and rates across a wide range of GVF. In this example that I'm showing here, gas is introduced between a reference meter and a test meter. The reference meter volume rate is shown in green. The test meter's unremediated output is shown in orange. Note that the meter is overreading by about 30%. And that, that would be expected Coriolis performance for that amount of gas. The test meter is also running the APM algorithm and outputting remediated volume flow as shown by the blue trace. So that's the same test meter outputting both the orange and the blue signals. Notice that the blue trace, uh, that, the one from APM, is significantly less noisy than the orange trace of the raw unremediated output. And note how the APM algorithm adjusts to changes in flow rate and gas content throughout the test. Over the course of the test, the gas void fraction was varied from 10 to 20 percent, and the error on the measurement was taken from 27 percent on that orange trace to 3 percent with the remediated output from a, the advanced phase measurement algorithm. So imagine taking the error 
on your gassy flows from about 30% down to 3%. Further testing has been done to illustrate the performance and highlight limitations, and I'd like to highlight a few of those limitations now to make sure we're not applying this where it won't work. So first and foremost, the EPM algorithm must see at least a few points at less than 100% drive gain. This means that a process that has 100%, well, not 100% gas, but has uh, gas 100% of the time, it's not a good fit for APM. This drives the limitations that we've set on the product data sheet uh, for 15% GVF or less. Uh, even though in lab testing, we've shown that the algorithm can be very effective even at higher gas void fractions, we discourage going to much higher ones because of the likelihood that you're going to get that occasional point off 100% drive gain. So we've got test results that show great performance at 50%, but in a laboratory we can ensure that every once in a while it sees a point of, of low drive gain. So this is important to consider when you're looking at applications that you might have for advanced phase measurement. It really does need to be intermittent gas. And on what period? Well, um, at least once per hour we're going to need, uh, or the algorithm is going to need to see something off 100% drive gain. Second limitation, um, and this is of particular importance for those wanting to get density-based net oil calculations, the algorithm cannot distinguish liquid density changes from GVF changes when bubbles are present. So for a net oil application, APM will hold the water cut constant through a bubble event if you're trying to use the density-based net oil. So in those cases, um, if those bubbles are going to be more continuous than not, we would encourage the use of an external water cut input to the transmitter to perform those net oil calcs with confidence. New water cut meters are becoming more and more gas tolerant, so this is uh, a more viable option than it's been in the past when water cut meters were strongly influenced by the presence of gas. And finally, Keeping in mind what we've learned about the inverse Stokes number and the decoupling model, small bubbles are key, and keeping velocity high through the meter is important. For some applications with extremely low, extremely low DP requirements, a Coriolis meter, even with APM, may not be an application fit. Okay? So work with your local representative for meter sizing assistance. So the applications where we've seen success, um, a number uh, have been on the outlets of separators, so particularly separators that are undersized or have, um, uh, say, level control issues like GLCCs. This is a great place for advanced phase measurement. Another place is direct well head measurement, specifically on heavy oil with low gas content or old brownfield wells with low gas content. Um, typically, a shale well is not a good application because the, the volatility of the oil causes so much uh, gas to be present at surface. Um, and then finally, gas applications. So let's go to um, what is your leading and train gas measurement application today? So quick survey question here. Is it flashing hydrocarbon off the oil leg of separators, undersized separators, plunger lifted wells, heavy oil with gas, old brownfield wells with low gas or other. We'll give folks a minute to, to reply here. And we'll take a look. All right, so here we're seeing flashing hydrocarbon off the oil leg of separators. That's 26% of the responses and 21% are undersized separators and then another 20% is other. So very interesting. Um, definitely there's, there's a lot of different solutions out there that could be discussed, particularly off the oil leg of the separator. So we're in the home stretch here, let's talk results. APM has been applied on a number of trials in the Bakersfield area on mobile test separators. So Coriolis meters were installed both on the inlet to the mobile test separator and on the liquid leg outlet. 
Uh, that liquid leg outlet served as the reference meter. So for an ESP lifted well with an average GVF of 5%, the Coriolis meter without advanced phase measurement gave an error versus the reference of 10% on volume totals over the course of a several hour test. With advanced phase measurement, that same meter on the inlet to the separator provided measurement at less than 1% difference from the meter. So what did that data look like? So here's a 30-minute um, snippet of the data from that test. And what you'll see is the reference meter is shown in green. The inlet meter without APM is shown in orange. Notice that variability in the orange from 200 to 1,000 barrels per day. That's expected when you've got a lot of gas going through that meter. With APM applied to the orange results, you see the blue trace that much more closely follows that reference meter, providing less than 1% error on a direct wellhead measurement. So keep in mind, the orange right there, that represented 10% error in the volume rate over the course of the test, and the blue is at less than 1% error. Further testing in the area yielded a few rules of thumb that I'd like to share. First, Results are best on wells with continuous flow. Um, so with correction, with ESP, natural flowing, etc., cetera, we, we achieved really great results up to 15% GVF. Improvements possible on a beam pump, um, but definitely the beam pumps, uh, we struggled a bit more, and GVF up to 5% would be a rule of thumb there. Now, I know oil outlets of separators represent variable flow, but considering how dumps work on the separators, we would make really significant improvement off of separators that have nice, quiet periods between each dump. So... Um, much better improvement is possible for those separators. It's just these beam pumps that aren't great applications for us. Um, so I wanted to highlight uh, that even in very unfavorable uh, conditions, uh, we can make a significant improvement. So we had one well with uh, an average 30% GVF, and that well we were able to correct it from 155% error to 8% error using the algorithm. So again, we're not talking custody transfer here, but significant improvements in measurement can be made and provide much better insight to well performance. And often it's insight that, that really provides you the um, ability to improve production from a field. So this example here came from a direct wellhead measurement made off a beam pump where the meter provided immediate indication that the most productive portion of that pump stroke was compromised, uh, producing this rabbit ears looking flow profile. So with this info, it was easy for the engineer to quickly diagnose that there was belt slippage on that beam pump, and they were able to fix that um, very quickly. So improvements like these can make a big difference, especially in such a tight uh, oil price environment. So let's wrap up with uh, just a few notes on installation and application considerations. So first, sizing. Um, I, I think I've driven this home quite a bit, but I do want to emphasize that sizing is really important and installation is really important for success here. So anytime you can, install flag flow up to keep those bubbles balanced and blind tees can be really useful um, to promote mixing before the fluid enters the Coriolis meter. Um, that said, You've got to consider the DP considerations of your application. If you've got a very volatile fluid, if it's flashing, then we would prefer to size the meter to keep the fluid single phase first and foremost, rather than trying to do all this uh, hullabaloo to compensate for and train gas that doesn't need to be present up front. Additionally, a few other considerations, so um, distance from the source of the uh, multi-phase flow to the meter is important to think about. If you've got very long straight runs or manifolds, those straight runs or manifolds can act as separators, resulting in very, very large bubbles and large error. So remember our inverse Stokes uh, number there. If you have very large bubbles, you're going to have very poor performance. If the meter is installed, um, 
off a manifold or header, consider the size versus the range of flow rates that could be expected, particularly if wells are on a pad or wells on a pad are shut in. You could dramatically drop your flow rate, rate through that meter and change yourself from good measurement to poor measurement just due to that velocity drop. Um, consider the lift type. Uh, if it is a beam pump, we strongly recommend installation of a check valve to prevent bidirectional flow during those lowest flow periods. And though reservoir engineers will cringe whenever possible, increase the back pressure to reduce the gas void pressure and the bubble size. Um, we do very much encourage modeling to determine gas void fraction, and we'd be happy to help with that if, if you need help to determine what the GVF of your well is at the point that you'd be installing the measurement. Um, we also encourage folks to consider life of field. How will that well or field decline over time, and do you plan changes in artificial lift or enhanced oil recovery that may change the GVF expected at the measurement point? And finally, just to wrap up and give a little time for questions here, in summary, advanced phase measurement offers a clear step forward in improving Coriolis performance in multiple phase flows um, with attention to best practices on sizing and installation. Performance of better than 3% can and has been achieved in wells with average GVFs up to 15%. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and hand it over to Amy, who's been monitoring questions. Amy. This is Amy Richardson, Managing Editor at Flow Control. We are now entering a time of questions and answers. If you have any additional questions during the Q&A session, please type them during the session, and we will cover them if time allows, or answer, answer them online afterwards. Laura, if small gas bubbles are key to APM being effective, what is considered small, and how would the bubble size be controlled? So, thank you. Um, first, uh, small bubbles are the key to any Coriolis meter's performance when entrained gas is present, whether you have APM or not. And so it's a general best practice, not something that APM in particular requires. Um, what is considered small? Well, certainly um, I don't have a specific size to, to throw out there, but when you look at um, pictures of flow measurement through um, glass tubes um, at say, um, Reynolds numbers that are in the laminar flow region versus pictures of the bubbles, and this is with the viscosity of, of water, per se, versus the size of the bubbles when you're in turbulent flow. There's a dramatic difference, and you can see a dramatic difference in the performance of a Coriolis meter. So for low viscosity fluids in particular, if you can get up into a turbulent flow regime, that's ideal, because at that point you're breaking bubbles that have been say coalescing at lower um, flow rates, you can get those broken down into much smaller bubbles just due to that turbulent flow. So as a general rule of thumb, I'd say if you've got a low viscosity fluid, do what you can to get into a turbulent uh, Reynolds number. Thanks, Laura. This question comes from Dan. You talked about WC measurement. Do you have a recommended end device? Uh, a recommended uh, water cut measurement that is less influenced by um, gas. Uh, the, the one I'm most familiar with is a product from Emerson, of course. Uh, the Rockstar water cut meter uh, has made great strides to not be influenced by, um, by bubbles up to a fairly high GVF. And so that's the one I'm most familiar with. But certainly, a number of water cut uh, measurement companies have been making strides in that area. The next question is from Brian. How far below 100% drive gain per hour is needed? Is 98% enough? Yes, 98% is enough. Um, so yes, we are looking for, um, even if it just, if the actual measurement just touches 100%, the actual 100% and isn't uh, saturated beyond that, that's enough for the algorithm to acknowledge that it is now getting a new um, density measurement that is um, going to be considered 
as a new set point. Now, it's not that it necessarily uses the density at 98% um, drive gain because that density is influenced by gas because you are measuring bulk mixture density. So the algorithm is making consideration at that point that the density as seen at 98% isn't necessarily the hold value, but it is now more confident in the value that it will grab because it's seeing that the amplitude of the tubes is back to where it needs to be to have good Coriolis force and good measurement. So when you're looking at your application, 98%, 99%, once an hour, that's, that's good enough for the algorithm. We have time for one more question. I know the GOR of my wells, but I don't know the GVS. Can you size up an application with GOR? Okay, um, so good question. I've had that one a couple of times. No, um, we'll definitely need not just GOR of the well, but we would need to know the pressures and temperatures at the point where we'd be installing the meter. Um, GOR, of course, has all been uh, converted back to standard, and usually it's standard, well, always it's standard, your gas rate or your gas volume is going to be significantly higher than it would be uh, at the point of install, which would be pressurized. So we'd need to know not only what your GOR is, but also the pressure and temperature at the point at which we could install the meter. And of course, the higher the pressure, the lower the gas void fraction, the better chance we have of making a good measurement with the Coriolis meter. Thanks, Laura, so much for answering these questions. Any questions we didn't respond to in the session today will be posted with responses on our website at flowcontrolnetwork.com. All attendees will receive an email afterward with a link to today's presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. This concludes our webinar. Thank you.